It's great. The newest update to SCP Containment Breach creator Jonas Raconin's submarine survival RPG Baratrauma New Frontiers absolutely delivers on and cements the groundwork for so many of the hopes I had for it in my previous video. So what's new? Outposts are now fully explorable with random interactions, shops which you can buy from or sell goods and materials to which you couldn't previously do, plus purchasable submarine upgrades and discoverable missions, all of which are distributed by autonomous AI inhabitants. There is a new reputation system, interacting with the world gains and loses you favor with the various factions in it and affects things like the prices of goods at outposts and the kinds of events you can encounter. One thing I have mixed feelings about is headsets, which were altered to no longer consume power so their battery can't die. This is meant to make communication easier, and it does, especially when you need to continue issuing commands to a ship full of bots while out on a mission. But I'll be real, I kind of miss the terrifying feeling of realizing I'm running out of battery at an inconvenient time. It's an additional resource that you need to be prepared to deal with, but Infinite Battery is clearly a placeholder since radios are being actively worked on. A recent minor update added the ability to change between radio channels instead of the entire crew sharing one band, so odds are it's going to be expanded on soon. Sticking with the world building theme, Fakefish has also added persistent identities for AI crew members on your ship so you can grow more attached to your questionably intelligent companions before they inevitably get eaten. It's worth addressing that in its current state, the AI is functional, but still very much a work in progress. I experienced issues with crew suffocating because they didn't change their oxygen tanks, which I thought had been dealt with previously. But I reason that they've added so many new AI-related elements to the game with this update that some issues are understandable. Since this is an ongoing look at an early access game, what I look for here is the response to the problem, and the devs have openly addressed the issue on their roadmap and have recently implemented fixes to help smooth over or outright solve certain issues like allowing AI crew to spawn in oxygen tanks if they're unable to find one. It is kind of cheating, but given the alternative, I'm not complaining. When they aren't hunched over in a corner huffing carbon dioxide, AI engineers make sure the generator doesn't blow up, AI mechanics wander around performing maintenance, AI medics diagnose and treat ailments, and AI security guards do security. It's not always pretty to look at, but the core functionality is there, so while I wanted to touch on it, I'm holding off judgment beyond that for now. And I think it's important to keep in mind that this applies to a lot of the things I talk about here. When they work, I like them. But sometimes missions completely glitch out and you need to revert to a backup save, if you have one. I found an outpost that had something wrong with its wiring and would spontaneously burst into flames every time I started the level, so I think it bears mentioning that for now these moments of instability are consistent enough to impact the experience of the average campaign, but I'm willing to gloss over these sorts of issues as growing pains that will continue to be smoothed out. If there is one thing that has stood true throughout the early access period of Baratrauma, it is the willingness by the dev team to drastically rework what they already have in favor of the end vision. It still absolutely is the same game, it's just becoming more and more like Baratrauma the complete experience. This new update adds layers of brilliant reimagining of game systems that completely change the way you interact with the world, and shows that sometimes it's just about how the information is presented. If I flatten a peanut butter sandwich and roll it up like sushi, it is technically the same thing, but I'm gonna have more fun eating it. I'm going on the same old missions as always, but now I'm picking up two or three of them at a time, and a character in the world is the one telling me about it. A world which feels substantially larger thanks to the new navigation map. You can't zoom out and see everything anymore, but a placeholder ending, which is at least better than no ending, is out there somewhere. However, thanks to the new lay of the land, the urge to go deeper as fast as possible is less pressing. Eldritch horrors from the deep? Pfft. Don't worry about that. Visit some outposts. Do some scavenging. Tase a guy. Upgrade and experiment. The middle will be there when you're ready. Well, when you think you're ready. Fortunately, when you respawn at the outposts, there's plenty to look at. Where once they were sterile filler, now outposts feel alive and are packed with tons of new textures and objects. All of that, alongside the ongoing paint-over updates to old textures, has led to a lot of moments that make me go, Oh, well that's new. Right? Here's a safe bet. It's the same, but it's different. The same, but different. The same, pero diferente. But the addition of fully functional outposts means it's only a matter of time before we see infested or abandoned outposts, and before we do, I'd like to see an adjustment to the amount of loot that spawns in Rex. With the regularity that Rex spawn in now, what's the point of buying anything at an outpost other than bags to stuff with all the free expensive loot sitting in a waterlogged room 700 meters down? 
I mean, you deserve something for exploring and putting yourself in danger, and it makes sense that an abandoned facility would have supplies, but in context of the implications for the survival and economic elements of the game, it does feel out of balance right now. And there is clearly meant to be a balanced economy, the devs have stated as much. Buying and selling goods at the right outposts nets you better deals. Raw materials at mining outposts, weapons at a military outpost, but at this point, I'm good offloading at any outpost I come across, since I'm picking up an absurd amount of loot every time I stop at a wreck and the shopkeep only has a limited amount of money to spend on the goods anyway. Finding supplies from time to time is great. Finding a ton of supplies consistently is less great. Hang on, first the radio, now the supplies, am I asking to be hurt? Kind of. Speaking of which, I hadn't last time, but now I've seen the Thalmus, the living structure tentacle monster, in action several times, and it is exactly as sadistic as I had hoped. Instead of a boss monster inside of a dungeon, the Thalmus puts a dungeon inside of a boss monster. You go room to room, tracking down the brain, fighting threats along the way. Battling a Thalmus is undeniably exciting, if you can survive the initial onslaught. The Thalmus hits so hard and fast that some folks wind up dead before anyone even realizes what's happening. That can be frustrating, since in Baratrauma everyone is looking for the chance to go down in a blaze of glory, but the constant threat of a decidedly unglorious death can really raise the stakes. Somebody's got to die first. You hope it's someone else, but sometimes it's going to be you, and all you can do is watch as your progressively less recognizable corpse dissipates into a fine red mist as your crew bemoans how much expensive stuff you had on you. Even the considerable downtime after dying has its consolations, though. You and your corpse buddies can chat, place friendly bets on who's going to die next, or bond over shared hatred for the griefer that just killed you for no reason. In well-moderated lobbies, the host can keep an eye on logs, so if you are killed by a griefer, they can be dealt with quickly, unless the griefer is the host. As the game's community grows, a lot of people are going to be having that moment where they just go crazy because they can. Some of those people will have it done to them a few times and realize how annoying and repetitive this behavior is and chill out a bit. Others will grief until they're permabanned for most reasonable public servers and probably get bored and quit. The rest will become clowns. That's what happens in public lobbies. If you play enough public lobbies or ask around on the subreddit, you can meet people who you can play with in a private lobby. But enough complaining about griefers, let's talk about the subs. In addition to the implementation of the new ship upgrade system, which allows players to invest funds into upgrading the guns, armor, and various machines in their sub to make them more resilient and efficient, subs can now be categorized as a certain class. As of right now, custom subs with an undefined class can't be used in campaign, but the community is extremely active and since the update I've already seen some old subs adjusted and plenty of new subs designed with those restrictions in mind. But when the update first launched, none of the custom builds had defined classes, so the initial shortage of overstatted battle stations forced me to explore the vanilla game subs designed by the developers with flaws and shortcomings baked in. Briefly. I picked up a buffed up version of the vanilla sub Dugong as soon as I could for the sake of getting footage, but now that outposts have been turned into operational hubs, it's easier to justify something like not using power running an in-ship crafting room, saving money on fuel and supplies to invest in making the things your ship does have run better, or buying a larger ship once you have the funds and crew to maintain it. From what I've seen, you can't pay to install new machines, only improve existing ones, but who knows. But if you've really got the itch to add a crafting table for convenience or an interior turret for motivating your crew, a part of Baratrauma I didn't really touch on in my previous video was just how in-depth the design tool is. You can make adjustments to an existing build or go completely from scratch. And given the accessibility of the tool, it's right there on the main menu, some of the half-baked budget subs missing features feels less like developer oversight and more like an invitation to do it better yourself. Regalis regularly shouts out people on Twitter who make things he never even imagined. The workshop is full of mad scientists who have built subs that have everything from elevators and automatic targeting systems to fully functional theaters. I'm not kidding, it's a straight up theater. I don't think you could do a campaign in it, but just wow. Designers have gotten so good that the devs have tapped them for the design process, hosting sub, rec, and outpost design competitions to further increase the random variety of structures and ships you can come across. I think I can say much more confidently now that the way Baratrauma is shaping up after this update does justify it being a $30 release, contingent on the devs continuing to deliver on the roadmap like they have. But I'm curious, if Baratrauma had launched in 2019 at a hard $25 with the intention of moving up to 30 upon release, would that have made a drastic difference in getting people to give it a shot? 
That's a real question, by the way. If you own it or are here trying to decide whether or not to buy it, how much do you care about a $5 difference? What made the sale or has you on the fence still? But coulda, woulda, shoulda, the price is the price, and when it's on sale, you can pick it up for $20 to $25 anyway. And naturally, as I'm editing this video, Baratrauma has gone on sale for $15, which is much lower than it's ever been, so if you're looking for a chance to jump in, now is pretty good. Whatever you spend on it, the money is not just disappearing into a void. There's no take the money and run here. Even as I'm working on this video, the team just dropped a minor update that includes a rework of mud raptors, gardening, and cleaning, as well as a laundry list of both minor and major bug fixes and changes. Just a cursory glance at Trello paints a clear picture of the dedication this crew has to shaping Baratrauma into something truly extraordinary that justifies its price tag. The hopes and dreams section is still a ways off, but the short and long-term lists include things like radiation from things other than an exploding reactor, plants that grow in your ballast tank and siphon energy from the ship, a terrifying looking rework of the infamously janky endworm monster, and other previously unseen behemoths that look Bat-like arms for grabbing? Bat-like arms for grabbing. It's gonna be great. So, that is a status report on the Barrow Trauma New Frontiers update, as well as the mini-update they dropped last week. I figure they're going to flesh out most of the things they introduced in the mini-update in the next major update, so I didn't want to talk about it too much but it felt weird to put out a video this late into New Frontiers and not at least mention it. Most of the players I talked with seem very happy with New Frontiers, and some of those people came and subscribed. Hi! <laughs> the support on the first video has been unreal, and so now I appreciate everyone bearing with me as we figure out exactly what we're doing with this channel. I'll be talking about Baratrauma again when the next big update drops, but in the meantime, let me know if there are any other early access games you'd like to see a status report for. I have my own list, but I'm always looking to add to it. In the meantime, you can leave a like to help the channel grow, or subscribe to see what else we do. But until then, I'm Jamie. Thanks for watching Standard Gaming.